Thanks. Okay, so thank you for attending uh, this uh, session. Well, can I mute myself because I'm hearing myself back? Now, okay, that's better. I'm sorry? I think so. No, that should, fine. That should be fine now. I just uh, turned it off on my laptop. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, so yes, this is about the i3z 802 15.4 Mac layer. Um, I'm Mikkel, I work for Bootlin, and uh, besides other activities in the, in the Linux kernel, I recently got involved in uh, the WPAN subsystem. Um, so I'm gonna go through the, the specification very quickly just to give a little bit of context of uh, what I've tried, what I'm trying to bring upstream. And then I'll show what's uh, now ready and uh, some issues that I've had. So very quickly, this is a figure that I tried to, well, that, that captures where the, the, the specification, all the, the two layers that are defined in the specific specifications are. Uh, it, it only defines the Phi and the Mac layers in the OZ model. On top of them, you'll find six Lopan and uh, the ZigBee applications. Uh, what I'm interested in right now is the Mac, Mac layer. Uh, which offers two kinds of services, the data services on one side, that's well, the data, and the Mac management services through the, what we call the MLME, the Mac um, sublayer management entity. So that's all what is related to the, to the peers around you. So um, we want to make networks, and in this case, personal wireless personal area networks, PANs, so in a pan, you'll find a, co a pan coordinator, which is the, 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 the most powerful device. Um, it's usually mains powered and uh, should, be, should have quite a lot of uh, compu computational resources. It may serve as a bridge with the internet. Aside, you'll find coordinators. So coordinators are also mains powered and uh, fully featureful, while uh, and in at the, in the, at the endpoints, you'll find leaf nodes, which are usually battery powered and uh, much less featureful than the others. So how do we find the peers around you? Because that's the main um, target. Uh, instead of having to describe the network statically in the lab and then bring it to the field, we want the devices to connect together automatically. And that's uh, how we do that. We use beacons as very short frames being sent by the coordinators to advertise the, the PAN. So the PAN is the network in which they are. So the beacons can be either sent at a given rate. Uh, so the rate is important for um, uh, power consumption for the leaf devices. And so you, send, you have a coordinator that sends the, those beacons at a regular rate or other, other networks where there is no, uh, so they are called uh, non-beacon enabled networks where you can request a beacon from the different coordinators that are in range by sending a beacon request which is typically an MLME command. Uh, so while you uh, just after sending those, uh, this request uh, you have to scan the, the channel so a scan usually takes different channels because you don't know where the other devices are talking so uh, there are three types of uh, scans. Uh, we are interested about two here. The passive scans would just change channels and wait a bit of time on each of them to, uh, to gather the, the different beacons. Or the active scans to actually trigger a beacon emission from the different coordinators uh, around. What's interesting also with the scan is that you'll get an LQI, a link quality indicator value uh, which is actually pictured uh, on, the, on the edges here. Uh, so this link quality indicator just tells you the strength of the signal. So maybe if you want to associate with the coordinator, you will choose the one with the strongest signal. So my journey started by trying to um, add scanning and beaconing support for the discovery of the surrounding devices. And then Elaging and shrinking the network with the different associations and disassociation commands. Uh, we try to keep all those devices synchronized either by having those beacons being sent at regular intervals or also by acknowledging some frames uh, just to, see, to tell the other device that uh, yes, we received 
the, 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 the frame and it is still synchronized with the rest of the network. And for the last point, the faulty situations, that's actually something that I haven't implemented yet. Uh, so that may happen if you have a loss of contact with your coordinator or also when two coordinators, two pan coordinators um, have the same pan ID and are too close to each other. Uh, there are pan ID conflicts that may arise. So this is not something that I've, I've handled yet, but uh, with all the infrastructure that we've been progressively adding in the subsystem, that should not be too, compli too complicated to, to add in the future. Right, so uh, let's go through the, the kernel stack now, the Linux kernel stack. So I tried to picture more or less how everything was connected together. Um, it, took, it took me a couple of iterations and uh, Alexander's feedback, Alexander Aring feedback. So at the bottom we have uh, the, the hardware, the hardware transceiver. They have a PHY, at least they have a one PHY. Uh, maybe in the future well, they will have more. I, I don't think it's something that is uh, uh, that exists today. So we can just focus on the leftmost column of this figure. Uh, the file has a. Uh, uh, well, is, uh, uh, so there are uh, there are transceivers out there that have two different files for like sub and normal 2.4 gigahertz and stuff like that. But we really don't support that. So the way we would envision that later on would be like having like two devices basically being being seen and being. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, uh, when you have a file, you should have a strut wpan file that well, describes the hardware, of course. That's what the transceiver driver will, uh, will use. And each file in the end may uh, lead to the creation of several sub interfaces. So, the sub interfaces are really software things uh, because we may want to have a different access to the network from different, uh, with different roles. The three different roles that are now possible are node, coordinator, and monitor. A node is usually just a leaf node. A coordinator well, has a little bit more power, like uh, advertising the pan by sending beacons, and also associating uh, devices in the network. And the monitor interface is not something that is described in the specification, I think, but uh, was introduced to make uh, sniffer devices, basically. So they allow everything, all the frames to be forwarded to the upper layers so that the upper layers can see exactly what happens on the, on the network. And this is actually very useful. On top of that, we have... So this is all part of the max layer, by the way. That's where the scanning feature was implemented, the beaconing, the associations, all of that. Uh, the max layer interacts with the upper layers through the CFG layer, which is a thin, compatible thing. Uh, actually, today we only have a soft Mac implementation. Uh, the right column, the rightmost column, is just uh, just to, to give you uh, an idea of how we could wire a hard Mac driver in the kernel. We have a hard Mac device today in the kernel, but it's wired through the soft implementation, so it's a bit specific. Anyway, uh, on top of that, we have the netlink layer, of course, which makes the the interaction with uh, with the, the user space typically. So, um, the interfaces that we've uh, added are uh, the scan and beaconing interfaces. So, those are two netlink commands. Those netlink commands just need a couple of, um, of, of parameters, such as the type of scan, if it's active or passive, uh, the, type, the, the beacon interval, or the time you want to wait on each channel, the channels to use, of course. Once all of that has been proce processed, it's forwarded to the max sublayer. The max sublayer will then really handle the request by stopping the, trans the TX traffic, um, updating the filters, because typically for a scan, you want to receive beacons. So if you have uh, very strict hardware filters, address filters, the beacons might not uh, get received because there is no destination field in a beacon frame. And um, once everything has, well, you create a, a we created a structure and started a background thread to handle the request. The, the background uh, thread, of course, can be aborted at any moment. And for the beaconing thing, you can also change the, the interval uh, while it's running. For the associations and disassociations, we don't really need a background job. 
uh, but we absolutely need the, the MLME commands to be acknowledged. So that was an additional problem that we had to solve. And um, very often send also a response to the request we would receive. We should probably forward the association requests to the user space or to the user, whatever, which one it is. Uh, that's something that was um, asked by Alexander, but I didn't implement it, it yet. Uh, just because, uh, well, I wanted to focus on the main features for now. Right now, an association is being uh, accepted immediately, but I think this ping pong would not be very complicated, I guess, uh, just because uh, the, all the infrastructure is already there, and this operation is not very time critical. But I mean, at some point we will need it. Um, right now, that's completely fine to go that, go that down the path, but at some point we will need some kind of coordinator daemon or something in the user space to like handle all the leases for the different uh, devices and so on, handle short addresses, like have the, the mapping and so on, and like expose this uh, to other components in the system or something. We had that before when the stack was initially merged like many, many years back. We had a component for that, but then we changed the, the net laying interface that wasn't working. So I mean, before we merged it in, so um, just saying. At, at the moment it's fine, but at some point we will need that to get it up to user space and then handle it. Uh, I guess, yes. We will, definitely. Uh, so yeah, I would just wanted to make a short demo to show you how all this is working. So hopefully that will be quick and will work. Let me try that. He doesn't want to enter full screen, I guess. How am I supposed to turn this, make full screen? This one? We tested it right before and it worked. <laughs> no? That's what it makes. Well, maybe I can just try with that. Yeah, okay, it's working, right. Well, it's not full screen, I'm sorry. I, I, I cannot make it larger, larger. I don't know, the, the arrows don't, don't work. Yep. Oh, okay, on this one. Right. So, um, here is a, uh, I'm on a virtual machine that is connected to my devices here. So I have three AT USB devices there that run the Linux stack, as well as a, uh, an Arduino Nano working, uh, running Zephyr. So I'm gonna start with uh, setting one of those th three devices as a monitor interface. So let's uh, start Wireshark. So that we can get a better view of what's ongoing. Um, I can now show you just the association strip that I'm gonna run. So it just basically sets up all the two other interfaces on the same channel. It creates a coordinator. Then it sets a, uh, the pan, a pan ID and an address on this coordinator. This coordinator will start emitting beacons, so advertising the pan. Then the other device, the leaf node, will scan around on a single channel because I know which one it is, just to save time. And once this, uh, once it will have uh, received a, um, a beacon, uh, we will extract the address of the coordinator and we'll try to associate with it. I will list the, the associations on both sides. So one has a child, the other has a parent. And then I'll just uh, disassociate the device the leaf node will ask to be disassociated and list the, the, the associations once again. So here, are, of course, it's a, big, a bit, uh, bit big. So here are all the interfaces. Uh, we start the scan. We now get the, coordinate, the coordinator. I try to associate with it and it lists the associations. Now I deassociate and I get no other associations. If I open Wireshark, we can see that we first had three beacons being sent by the coordinator, then an association request sent by the, by the leaf node, 
the association request was first act, then it was it received an association response. Uh, if we look at the association response, we can see that oh, there, there was a short address that was provided. So EF66 and a status which was successful. Um, so EF66, which is the address that we find here in the end, because the device accepted this short address and will answer on the network with this address. Let's go back to the presentation. Yeah. Oh yeah, I need to enlarge once again. Now I can do it. Well, I maybe I should do it on the other one. Yeah. All right. Uh, so those are the, the 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 patches that I've sent. You have the links there. If you want to check out, uh, I advise you to take the ones from GitHub because I have like a sixty series patch waiting, and of course I'm only sending the ten patches or so each time. So those are most up to date. Uh, I also had, well, I, I skipped the Zephyr demo, but it works also with the, the Linux stack. Uh, on Zephyr, I had to make a few changes as well. So this is ongoing. I've uh, asked a few questions and sent a pull request. Uh, so now let's uh, talk about the major issues that I had. I'm going to be quick on the first one because they were more or less fixed. Uh, for the transmission, the ME transmissions, I had of course, an issue with uh, the, the fact that the, the subsystem expects asynchronous transmissions. Uh, this cannot work for MLME transmissions because we want a status. Uh, while for data, we don't want to wait for the overall operation to be over because the transceiver will receive the, the packet to transmit and then wait a slot. Maybe it won't get it and wait even more. If it doesn't get a hack, it will have to retry again and again and for data purposes, this doesn't really make sense. So we had to create a synchronous API on top of the asynchronous one. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we actually used existing helpers, which uh, would help us track the number of ongoing transmissions, just to know that the data has been transmitted. Now we can send our own frames. And upon uh, sending our own frames, we want a status. So we need to know if the transmission went well or not, if the medium access uh, failed or not, and we added a, a reason byte um, to one or to the error uh, helper just to give us this information. This information, of course, is only available if we have um, if we have a, uh, a, a well if the device is able to provide that uh, that byte. So I don't think this is something that has been in, in, included in the specification. The devices that I used here had a track status. Hopefully, this is widespread. Uh, but unfortunately, in my case, the firmware didn't support it. So with the help of Alexander, we brought support in the firmware and in the driver for those track status, just to be able to know if there was a medium access failure or if there was an acknowledgement failure. I'm, I'm sorry that you had to go through that, because that is something I, I was supposed to add to the firmware like a few years back. And I talked to that with Alexander already a while back, but we never had a real need. So now it was falling back to you to get it fixed. So I'm sorry for that. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, he, he was uh, really quick uh, to answer. So now I, I get it. Uh, all right. Uh, we then had a uh, filtering constraints, well, filtering issues, uh, because in the subsystem, uh, so far we only had two filtering levels, either nothing or full filtering. The problem is with the um, uh, no filtering at all. So the community called that promiscuous mode, but in the specification, if you look, it's not called like that because promiscuous mode in the specification means we check the validity of the, validity of the frame. Here, it's, uh, the, this promiscuous mode, that how it is implemented, doesn't check anything and uh, is here just for implementing monitor interfaces. So uh, we wanted to have a middle level filtering thing because we had to receive, um, we had to receive the, the, the acknowledgements, for instance, and the, um, 
And well, for the scan, we had to receive the beacons, which I repeat, don't have a destination field. Uh, for the, um, we had another issue with the acknowledgements, of course, because the acknowledgements, well, anytime you want acknowledgements, you cannot use the no filtering level because no filtering means that the frame doesn't go through the address filters. So you don't know if the frame belongs to you. So you cannot emit an acknowledgement in response. So, well, we had to uniformize a little bit what was uh, in the, in the, in the stack. In particular, the promiscuous mode, which was a, a function completely aside of the other filtering levels, uh, the address filters. So Alexander provided a patch to have a first unification. Uh, but, uh, well, this is still ongoing. We are still discussing it. I think we're agree, but uh, we need to find the right way to, to implement that. But does that mean that you will be, we, one will be able to monitor on an interface that's actually active in ascending acts? So um, <clears throat> on the same, in, well, on the same phi, yeah. we won't have a, a, an interface in promiscuous mode and an interface actually interacting with the, the other devices, just because of this acknowledgement issue. Acknowledgement. So we so, still need two, two devices, one to watch and one to, you, to debug. I guess so. One to debug least, with and one to be active. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For now, that's the solution that we went for because we don't know how to handle those acknowledgements. I actually tried to handle them manually, but any way they are time critical, so that doesn't work. I mean, the, the, if it's time critical, I mean, that is something I was thinking about for a while now. It might be possible to do that on the Linux side, but as a soft a software, a soft uh, Mac implementation as well for the ARC, but I'm not sure if you really want to do that. I mean, the hardware support is supporting that and that's way more reliable than if you do it on, on, uh, on the Linux kernel side and then we might miss whatever one and then you have to resend and so on. That would be, be not a good, but I mean, if we would have it, it would be a lot more flexible. So I know that, for example, all the Arch systems they have often have like a soft Mac uh, implementation for for ACK as well, and they they use it for like piggybacking extra data in the ACK frame back to the back to the um, other device. So. You mean they have acknowledgements handled in the Mac in the soft Mac? Yeah, but that's out of so that's not on the long side. So I know that at least um, one it was not Zephyr, not Riot. Uh, anyway, there was some some wireless sensor network coming out of academia. I, I Kontiki. There was a, in, in Kontiki there was like a way of doing that, and then I'm, because I know they use that to like piggyback a, a bit bit of data back in the egg frame back to the uh, actually um, sender. So okay. yeah. So, so the, the practical operational side of this is that if you actually deploy devices into the field, right, and as you say the. The, 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 the one running Linux is probably the one plug into, into the wall with power and the ability probably to have an SSH or something into it. So as soon as you have a network problem, of course, what do you want to do? You want to TCP dump Wireshark it and the requirement that you then plug in another device to do that <clears throat> is a, it's a, it's a break, that's breaks, right? So, so somehow being able to do it would be really nice and is probably operationally uh, critical to make to figuring out why networks are broken when they're broken. Otherwise, people would just say, "Okay, this sucks. We're going to go back to I don't know, backnet or something, right?" But, but I mean, it's not really that easy to do that. I mean, we have been. Um, I know what you mean, um, and I mean for my development purpose, I just plug in another ATUSB and run Wireshark on it. But I completely understand why you want to have that for a deployment scenario where you see that's a problem. But I mean, it's very hard to get that all right in, in the Linux side where we have like one file exposed with like no filtering at all, like to, to get get all the data and then one where all the uh, names and so, uh, the filters are set correctly to like make sure. So you have to see, but it's, I mean, it's work in progress right now. We, we, we see what comes out of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, so the two last uh, problems that we've had and they are fixed, but uh, I don't really like how it's uh, to, today. Uh, so it's with the log depth and uh, well, uh, bottom line, the RTNL is a pain. So uh, for scanning, um, well, scanning involves having a background job that changes the channel, well, in the background. When changing channels, we need to acquire the RTNL. Um, 
when we are in this background job, we need somehow to protect the, the, the structure that describes the background job because it can be asynchronously accessed by user space through the netlink commands. So we also have implemented a lock there to uh, protect this structure, which makes a dependency between the two. And of course, um, the, RT, the RTNL must also be acquired whenever you start a scan or do whatever else with the channels, just because right now, as it is implemented, you don't have any other choice than acquiring the RTNL when you need a net device structure. I know in the wireless subsystem, uh, it's been removed. This, well, uh, in some places it's been removed. Uh, in the, in the WPAN subsystem, it's not yet the case. So uh, we had to find a, another way. Uh, I was, oh, did you find a way? Well, <laughs> yes, okay. it's a bit crappy. Uh, we, I just acquire the RTNL at the top of the background job for now, and then I acquire the scan lock. I know the scan lock is not really useful in that, in, in, in that moment, but at least it shows where it should be taken. And if we ever remove the RTNL at some point, we might not have any other um, uh, issues with the locking thanks to this uh, scan lock that I've already introduced. Another possible approach would be just putting things into a work queue structure of some kind, because then uh, they will be asynchronous. Uh, there won't be any contention and because you've ordered things properly. So that's just one alternate approach. Oh, you mean not uh, depending on the RTNL because you create the request somewhere else uh, in, a, in, a, in another uh, deferred work queue? Yes, yeah. And then, uh, so if you queue access to this thing, you've obviously done your mutual execution that way. So. Yeah. I mean, okay. the idea would really to be also to get rid of the RTNL um, stuff in, in, in WPAN, like wireless is doing it basically, but we really, yeah, that means basically someone needs to sit down, look at all the stuff and make sure that nothing bad is happening if you are going to remove that part. So, um, yeah. Anyway, I think, I think like getting, getting your work done with like, the, as you said, like taking it at the top of the, uh, of the process, that's okay uh, for now, but we really need to make sure that we, um, we figure that out. Oh, sorry. Do we have uh, time for the last one? But this one. Um, so yeah, the last uh, looking issue that I had um, was with the, the, the work queue uh, of the device. So the device already had a work queue, which I used to queue my background jobs. Uh, the problem is, of course, now I take the RTNL in the, well, I have to take the RTNL in the background job and the work queue itself also has a work queue completion lock. At stop time, the RTNL, of course, is taken. And within the stop callback, we also need to flush the work queue. Flushing the work queue involves acquiring the uh, work queue completion lock. Well, at least uh, that's uh, lock that told me that it was taken. So this could not work. So what I've ended doing, uh, I think it's fine, is creating a second work queue uh, just for the Mac commands. And because I know uh, in my implementation, we can no longer have any background job for the Mac commands running when we stop the device, I don't really need to call the, the, the uh, flush work queue call. So I no longer have this dependency. I suppose good, that's, that would work. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. fine. So thanks everyone for your attention. And uh, if you want to talk about that, I'll be there today.